Traditional finance knows something and they are making big moves right now. And I think this is going to be big for Bitcoin and the crypto market in general. Before I get and talk about those big stories, I just want to remind everybody that uh, it's going to be all right. Just relax. You know, right now, some people are a bit antsy about what's going on in the market. Just let it happen. And there was this promo that I did yesterday. This is for NFA Live with uh, me, Guy, and, and uh, Ben from the Cryptoverse. And I just said this. I go, you have to remember something. Let the weather be the weather. Let the market be the market because you can't control either. And before anybody says, oh, well, Rob, well, I can control the weather or the government controls the weather. So that's one thing. I'm like, yeah, that may be true, but you're not the government. So just relax and just control the, the little sphere of control that you can possibly have and just move forward. So today what I'm talking about is there was a tweet from Charlie Baleo and he came out and he has a really good piece from Y Charts. He says, active managers had less than 20% exposure to equities last October. So think about it this way. Last October, when the S&P was at 3,500, now it's at 4,500, only one fifth of all the active managers that take money from people like you and me and actively uh, invest into those equities, they were during that time holding off, expecting something to happen that never happened. They really should have deployed that capital because now we're at 4,500. And of course, it says here today, their equity exposures jumped above 99%, so almost everybody with the S&P 500 above 4,500. So basically what's happening is this. These guys, they take your money, they take people's money, and they invest at the top. And they'll probably buy you know, towards the bottom because they don't know, either they don't know what's going on or they're just taking those different uh, funds that uh, people are giving them and just collecting massive amount of fees. So for me, when I see stuff like this, that is not what we're used to. Even here in the crypto market, you're probably a better investor than them. And you probably know more than them right now. So I can't tell you what to do as far as financial advice, not your dad and all those things. But I have to tell you, when people who are using these active managers to invest for them start to figure out like, wait, 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 I'm paying all these fees and you invest at the top and, I, and, and the gains have been paltry compared to all the different things that are out there. Why am I using you? And they start to look at all the things and go, hmm, you know what? There's this thing called Bitcoin and it's up 80%. Uh, since the beginning of the year, maybe I should try to look at Bitcoin and crypto and digital assets. Maybe just a thought. So when I see this, I just think to myself, when people say it's smart money getting into it, it's not smart money. It's just big money. And that would lead me to my next point where there was this, this video. And I can't play you the whole thing because this guy is just constantly cussing. And what is happening here is he was just told that he's not going to get a pension or he's going to have a, min a minimization of his pension after 30 years working in the yellow plant. And I can just tell you that I believe this is going to happen more and more. And there's been some discrepancies in the video itself. And someone said, no, no, he's, he's going to get his pension, but it's going to be, be reduced. And he says, uh, this company has been in rough shape for years. And I believe they are now finally on death's doorstep after the 35 billion bailout. So again, there's a lot of zombie companies that are out there. I don't know uh, what exactly this company is, but usually if you see something like this, just Google the term pension crisis and you'll know what I'm talking about. And you may be one of the victims of that yourself. So for me, when I take a look at these things, I'm like, why do we still have these archaic ideas of, of gaining funds by working for a company for 30 years that may or may not last? And then we try to get a pension, which is gonna be reduced. So for me, I think it's just better to invest for myself, diversify, and I'll play the cards that way. So let me just think about this in the comments section. I think people will be turned off and it will lead them into other assets that they can uh, accumulate. And that will be Bitcoin and digital assets. On top of that, here's a little story about how TradFi is coming over into our world. Chainlink, co-founder wants to bring trillions of dollars into the crypto from banks. And that is uh, Sergey Nazarov right there. And this is what we got. Chainlink launched its cross-chain interoperability protocol just a few days ago in the hopes of making it easier to send money between blockchains. If you don't know, I tweeted this out yesterday, uh, actually July 17th, three days ago. The Chainlink cross-chain interoperability protocol, CCIP, officially launched on Avalanche, Ethereum, Optimism, and Polygon mainnets. And again, I said, hey, look, this is a big news, but I'm super biased. You have to understand, I've been dollar cross averaging chain link since 2017, 2018. I sold some in the, in the bull market, but I've been dollar cross averaging since 2022. So for me, uh, take it with a grain of salt, but I think it's still pretty big. 
Co-founder of Chainlink has far broader ambitions than simply linking public blockchains together. Remember, it is an oracle, which it brings in outside data onto the blockchains, which they cannot do. So this is what uh, uh, Chainlink does. Sergey Nazarov anticipates that banks and financial institutions will roll out their own blockchains, likely controlled or permissioned in some ways, and that's okay. They can have their, their controlled and permission that's already been rolled out already, and they can do those things. But at some point, they're going to have to use some kind of chain, and it may be Ethereum or some other L1, but they're going to need oracles. He states, you have this public blockchain and internet of contracts primarily defined by DeFi. And you have this bank chain world, which I think will be primarily defined by real world asset tokens. The next stage will be getting these two worlds to, elap, to overlap. And when that happens beyond the efficiencies and the gains for each of these groups, then you will see blockchain industry as a whole, I think, grow very rapidly by trillions of dollars. And he states, so I've been seeing these banks blockchain stuff, or I've been selling these banks blockchain stuff for about six, seven years. And the historical pattern has been that when there's a downturn in crypto, the banks lose interest. But this time is the first time after the four cycles that I've been through that this has not happened. And I think the reason it hasn't happened is because their clients want blockchain stuff. And I'm gonna explain to you why that is in just a bit when we get to the stage two. So Nazarov claims that there's stages of bank adoption. Stage one focuses on custody. Stage two encompasses token, tokenization of real world assets. So you know when we had this uh, gentleman named Larry Fink and Larry Fink came out and he was talking about tokenization of assets. Well, just take a listen to this. This is like seven seconds. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. So that kind of lays it out right there, tokenization of real world assets. If you don't know who this is, this is Larry Fink. He is the uh, founder and CEO of BlackRock, and they have nine or 10 trillion assets under management. And they are one of those vi giant financial institutions that are vying for a Bitcoin ETF. So when Larry talks, I think people listen. And when Sergey is talking about like all of a sudden, he's like, wow, it's amazing. Now banks all of a sudden want this. It's because you've got other people in traditional finance going, you know what? We think we know what's good. And there it is. And then also when Sergey talked about how he says, well, you know, I've been selling these things to, to banks for years. He ain't lying. So this is from the Chainlink ecosystem. And you can see that Chainlink has been working with Swift since, oh, 2017. And Swift, if you don't know, is a messaging service, which is what allows us to transport funds between banks, which is an archaic and awful system and quite expensive. And then just recently, on September 29, 2022, Swift partners uh, with Chainlink, so it became official, even though they've been working in since 2017. So we can see that there's a lot of positive things going on in the synergy between traditional finance and, and crypto. And again, I think that's good for Bitcoin digital assets. But to finish up, he states that stage three is where Chainlink comes in. This is the development of financial protocols and their proprietary chains, essentially mirroring the contemporary DeFi. In that third stage, they're invariably going to be dealing with us because we power the vast majority of DeFi. They're going to need market data, identity data, automation, functions, all the stuff that we make, they're going to use. And I know that because I've already said a lot of the designs and the designs are basically copying the DeFi protocols we already power. So good luck to Sergey in that and uh, also to me because I own a lot of Chainlink. So <laughs> let's see how that works out. But I think it can be uh, quite a boom moving forward. But the, one of the things that he did talk about here, he talks about regulation. And when he talks about that to actually happen and to go forward, it's all going to hinge on the government that's in power at the point and also the SEC. And I know people are kind of anxious about the SEC, but I want to put this in perspective. And it's an article which talks about ripples in hot water, but the person that said it is the most interesting part. So, according to Christian Schultz, a former assistant chief litigation counsel at the SEC's enforcement division, he actually worked for the SEC in the enforcement division. It isn't just some lawyer off the street, somebody who doesn't really know too much. It's a guy who's already been there. 
and he states the SEC's case against Ripple has the potential to disrupt the agency's other ongoing legal proceedings, despite being a district court ruling. He states, there's no way to look at that Ripple decision as anything but a win for the crypto industry. XRP is not a security, and the companies and executives' transactions in XRP on the secondary market do not violate those laws. Although other federal district judges are not obligated to follow Torres' ruling, the opinion should still hold weight. That being said, it is a thoughtful decision from a well-respected jurist that other judges will find persuasive, and it could spell problems for the SEC in other pending litigation, such as Coinbase, particularly those that are focused primarily on secondary market activity. So um, we're talking about regulation. I think, I personally think Gary's days are numbered. I don't personally think the Biden administration is going to be around for the next presidential election. And that means that when they step in, the old ones step out. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then before we get too bullish, because let's not get over our skis, you're going to see articles like this. Take it with a grain of salt. This is uh, Jesse Pollock. He is uh, one of the lead developers on Coinbase's Ethereum-focused Layer 2 network called Base, and he says that 8 billion people will go on-chain over the next decade. Uh, he says, our feeling is that there's so much growth ahead of us. We have less than 10 million people on chain today. That's true. But there's going to be 8 billion people on chain over the next decade. Do you know how many people are in the world right now? 7.88 billion. I don't know where the other people are coming from. I'm not going to try to guess. Maybe he was misquoted. But just know that when you see stuff like these articles, just be aware that sometimes they are a little crazy. And to finish up, two items of, uh, of uh, concern to me. Uh, first of all, sweat. Sweat I've been talking about for quite some time on this channel. And uh, if you didn't know, they are the fourth largest DAP as far as like the, as it's called here, unique active wallets. And for the amount of people that are using this on DAP radar, they are the fourth largest wallets that are being used uh, on a 30-day rotating basis at almost a million and they are right behind PancakeSwap, V2 and V3. They are ahead of Uniswap V3. They are ahead of 0x protocol. They are ahead of a lot of different things. And I'm excited for this project, first of all, again, biased, bought into it, but also because it's finally gonna get rolled out in America on September 12th of this year. So in a couple more months, we'll have it. And I hear there may be a surprise listing. That's all hearsay, who knows? So on top of that, uh, also know that uh, as of this month, it is now becoming deflationary. And there's a couple of the surprises that are coming out. So that we'll cover that uh, later in another video, maybe on this channel or the secondary channel, Dan Degen. And then also I uh, interviewed Ken Oling, the CEO of Meld. And one of the things I told him was like, Ken, I don't trust you because you know, we gotta, we, gotta tr we gotta verify, we can't trust. So how do we know that things that you guys are doing, which is these self-paying loans and the yield application and how you're doing that, how can we trust you guys? So he said, well, talk to Pepe Blasco. So I had Pepe, who was the MELD CTO. He runs us how to take a look at MELD, which sits on top of Cardano and uh, Avalanche Chains, so you can verify and not trust. I will put that video out hopefully this weekend. And that is it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. So thank you so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.